We are about to go live on YouTube. Just waiting for it. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. And let me make sure we are recording as well. Oh, all right. There's some volume in the back. <laughs> I have a note here that you're live and recording. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I muted myself so we don't hear us twice. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday forum here with St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm glad to see some of you have joined us here on um, Zoom and we are also live streaming to YouTube and it'll be archived there as well in our um, Christian Formation playlist. I'd like to introduce you this morning to our guest speaker today is Dr. Heidi Campbell. She is a professor of communication at Texas A&M University and, and I'm extra proud to say that as I'm a graduate of that, um, that department for my PhD as well. We did not overlap. I graduated about a year or two before Heidi joined the faculty, but, um, but I'm uh, proud to be from that department and proud to host um, Dr. Campbell as our guest speaker this morning. Heidi is uh, an expert in digital religion and has been studying this for a long time and one of the founders of that subdiscipline in communication studies. And so we are happy to have her share her expertise with us this morning especially since we've all uh, here at St. Stephen's been experiencing um, digital religion in new ways over this past year during the pandemic. So uh, welcome, Heidi. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to be able to join you today. Um, I'm gonna start off with just a quick word of prayer and then we'll get going into today's um, talk. Father of all creation and creator of technology, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you to hear and to learn. Father, we live in a world where technology surrounds us and we pray that you'd help us to be wise stewards of those gifts that you've given us to be able to be salt and light, hope and promise in a world filled with many, many forces and many, many voices in your precious and holy name, amen. amen. <clears throat> So I've titled my day, my talk today of faith in technology. So if you want to put up the, the screen to share the slides. Um, just a little bit about me. I, I've been studying the relationship between religion and the internet since the mid 1990s. So for almost 25 years, I've been looking at especially how um, Christian um, groups use the internet and how it is shaping people's views of what it means to be the church, what it means to be part of a faith community. I actually did my PhD um, in Scotland at the University of Edinburgh. In, um, it was a joint degree in computer media communications and theology. So um, I can speak with a theologian hat on or a media scholar hat. And today I'm going to be kind of mostly a media scholar, but speaking into kind of um, uh, religion and the church and how these forces are, are shaping um, our world. Um, I'm highly Googleable. So if you want to learn more than you ever wanted to know about me, if you put Heidi Campbell and religion or Heidi Campbell in Texas, uh, you can learn a lot about my research. Um, just to note, there are um, a, a lot of Heidi Campbells out there and there's actually about six professors. So if you wanna make sure you're not getting the, uh, the one who teaches architecture or library science or chemistry, um, put either uh, uh, digital religion or Texas and you'll find me. So if you wanna move on to the first slide. So I wanna provide um, a few kind of bits of information and context. Um, just to kind of, um, uh, this first part of the presentation is to talk about what religion looks like and how religion has changed um, for many of us, especially over the last 12 months, but especially over the last few decades. So, you know, we live in this digital age where digital media is embedded in our everyday lives. You know, even um, if, we're, if you try to resist using technology, avoid Facebook, you can't help but being impacted by digital media. It, it's, it, it, it's 
in what it's a part of your work. It's part of how you do your banking. It's part of business. It's part of politics. And religion and the church has been shaped by this. And this is one of my, my main premises that um, the church um, has been shaped by living in this digital age. But oftentimes our theology and our um, uh, beliefs um, and practices haven't caught up with the kind of milieu we live in. So, you know, digital um, technology and the internet um, work in very different um, ways than other generations of technology. Um, the church has been around and churches for um, over the centuries has been willing to engage with different technologies from the printing press to the radio, um, television. Um, but in the age of mass media, um, people had a lot more control over the technology and the message. And what we've seen over the last um, uh, 50 years, especially is how people engage with church um, has changed and the internet has been part of that. I would argue that it's not the prime reason we've changed, but the internet had came in at a moment where we were experiencing this change. So, you know, 50 years ago, uh, you, church would be seen as, you know, the church around the corner. Um, you affiliate with a certain denomination or community and you go to the one, uh, that one, the church closest to you, probably geographically. But you know, over the last 50 years, people have moved from uh, to seeing church and community as geography based to church being something as a, of a choice. There's been much more of a consumer influence. So we now go to the church that is fits, fits our needs and our preferences. Um, and uh, like here, so the church has moved from just being this kind of sense of geography, but the sense of, of a gathering place, uh, but it's a choice that we make. And now over the last 20 years, as the internet has become part of this, it's um, church has not just become a gathering place, but it's become a connection place where the actually physical space is, and sometimes is considered less important than the venue of connecting. And, you know, this has been especially true when we were all forced online um, over the last um, year, where the, you know, we had to realize that, we, that the church, you know, we've seen it as a place, we've seen it as an event, but now we have to see it as something else because those two options are often not available to us. So that, you know, digital media are kind of characterized by the sense of fluidity. It's always changing. We're always getting upgrades. It's 1.0, 2.0. And um, it's about being willing to adapt and adopt new, new technologies and new innovations. And this is something that kind of challenges the church because we're used to tradition and um, theology, things that don't change. We also see that the internet, it's what we call decentralized. Um, so it's not hierarchical um, in the purest sense. You know, it's not a fully top down um, organization. And so people are, have the more ability to contribute, to talk, to be a part of, but then it's the, the challenge of who has the authority and who actually has the uh, ability to hold people accountable or to monitor or gatekeep. But this religious space that we now live in is this idea of how do we use the technology to interconnect with one another? And the internet is all about networks, it's about media, it's about interaction. So if you could move to the next slide. So this is a slide is, came out, has come out of my research, but also at a conference that I attended about um, eight years ago on um, theology after Google. And they were describing about you know, what they saw as changes um, uh, happening in how churches practice, but also people's mentality of what they expect out of church. And um, you know, the, this was kind of a slide that was created in the summary session at Food Conversation. So you know, the metaphor of church traditionally has always been led by the pastor or the priest. So the sense of there's a clear leader. Um, you know, we are defined by certain creeds, doctrines, and theology that are kind of set. Um, we kind of know which group we're part of because there's clear denominations, they have structures, they have certain um, affiliations, and we know kind of what the boundaries are within those and how they differ from others. Um, community was, and, and doing church was pretty kind of linear, li, uh, linear. you know, um, it's, you know, the, kind of, uh, the pastor or the priest would kind of set the tone. There was a liturgy that we entered into and it was certain practice. So church and was, as a, was a religious community, but it's what we call a bounded community. There was clear boundaries and distinctions about what was part of the, our, our tradition and what was outside, who was part of the community and who was not. But in a, a church 2.0 world where the di digital media and the ethos of digital culture has kind of infiltrated and become part of our practice, we see a different kind of metaphor and reality. 
So pass online, it's not just the priest and pastor. You know, tech people play a key role, and we've seen that this last year, of helping church happen. And so um, tech, church is seen as kind of generated by the people and not just by the leaders. Um, we call, call, um, talk about theology not just being, um, you know, kind of handed down, but it's um, much more conversational. Um, you think of a wiki, wiki, like a Wikipedia, is you go on and one person contributes something and then another person critiques that and adds something and they take away. It's this kind of process of creation. So the idea that theology is not just coming from one um, theologian or one, you know, set of kind of interpreters, it's coming from multiple people in conversation. Instead of kind of saying, oh, um, denominations being the kind of uh, groups that set the um, uh, expectations, it's about collaborations. And we see, have seen a lot more you know, networks of people as well as communities emerge. So instead of you know, the, the, um, uh, the process being linear, it's much more subjective and cross-platform. People are drawing from multiple spaces. And this is what we call in sociology network community. So instead of, again, um, the um, community's tradition or the religious leaders being the center of the community, we actually move to network community where the individuals are at the center. So that means that, you know, an individual, I, I have, I create my own community by the people I connect with, by the t technologies I use, by the choices that I make. So if we take kind of hierarchy out and put the individual inside as the person who defines and sets the community, this gives individuals a lot more freedom to talk about their theology, to create community. But it also creates a lot more challenges because that individual, me, I may not have the training to make those choices. I may make those choices based on my preferences or my experience and not necessarily the theology and traditional um, kind of gatekeeping that we have in the church. So we are kind of in this interesting point of tension of new possibilities, but it also comes with new challenges for religious leaders. So if you can move to the next slide. So again, I've been studying this for 25 um, years and about um, 10 years ago, I um, came up with uh, this, uh, a list of characteristics. And this was based on both me doing a large scale study of kind of all the people who've been researching for a, or a decade or more religion and the internet, what they said felt that they could firmly claim this is how religion is practiced online. And then I compared it against my own, you know, 20 years of research and um, was able to identify that there's kind of five clear traits of how Christianity also through of Judaism, Islam, and other religious but just to give you a brief context for today, um, if you can move to the next kind of three, the next slide, Becky. Uh, the next, another one. We are, you're breaking up just a little, so it's a little hard to understand. Um, I think we have a freeze. Well, hopefully, I think you're back. There was a little freeze moment there. Yeah. Although you're okay. visually still frozen, but we can hear you. <clears throat> All right. Oh. Uh, I'm uh, back. <laughs> we're back. You're sideways. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There we go. Okay. All right. Now we're back. Okay. All right. After contemplative pause. Um, uh, so the, there's five traits that I'd say uh, characterize how people practice religion online, but I want to talk just about three. Um, and they are convergent practice. And this speaks to how do people actually do the tangible practice of religion online, how that's changed from kind of, you know, the offline to online setting. Um, Multi-site reality, which talks about how our online and offline lives have been embedded in one another and what that means for our religious practice and beliefs. And then finally, storied identity. This talks about our religious identity and how we create and present our religious identity online is different than the offline setting. So if you can move to the first slide, we'll talk about um, convergent practice. Um, so conversion practice, it has the assumption that the internet is this kind of spiritual hub. Um, it and that allows people to kind of assemble and personalize their religious behavior and beliefs. 
In other words, the internet is kind of this great toolbox of resources that allows individuals to kind of assemble their kind of uh, uh, a religious formation track, you know. It allow, um, the internet allows you to kind of subscribe to, you know, the, um, uh, um, this day forward, you know, online email devotionals, and then you can go to this resource and um, uh, uh, for maybe online prayer, you can kind of become part of an um, online retreat or network. And so you can choose where you go to get those resources. And this means people not only can kind of pick and mix and put together those resources and tools that are helpful for them, it also means they aren't wedded to just one church or even one denomination. Um, increasingly, people um, pick a mix from multiple denominations, and even younger people are picking mixing from other religious traditions. So one example of how we can see this kind of worked out, if you could move to the next slide, um, is how uh, people use kind of their smartphones as kind of a religious device. Um, you know, it's, it's increase, uh, increasingly our smartphones aren't for talking to people. <laughs> They're about organizing our lives. They're about, you know, doing work. There's about, about doing business and, and buying things. And the smartphone has become an essential part of many people's um, religious uh, kind of uh, daily lives. You know, we can set timers to remind us when to pray. Um, you know, like Becky, who leads prayer online, we have these guides that are, are access to us. And but we can um, so we can download apps, we can download different resources and put, put together this new convergent practice, this blending of information and practices from multiple places. But again, that puts the individual very much at the center and gives them the new possibility of um, meeting their spiritual lives. But again, outside, it takes them outside the accountability of, again, one set of leaders, one set of voices to speak into their life, um, one set of interpreters. So again, a new sense of freedom, but then a new sense of challenge for religious communities and churches. If you can move to the next slide. Next, well, I'm talking about multi-site reality. And this is recognize the internet connectedness and embeddedness of our online and offline lives. So, you know, 20 years ago, um, we would have talked about, you know, how we're going onto the internet and surf the internet and exploring this new territory. And then we come out and live our real world lives. But increasingly, there's a lot of bleed over or blending between the online or offline. Um, I have a lot of people I consider close friends, but it's been years literally since we actually sat in a coffee shop and not just because of COVID, um, because of distance and because of, you know, uh, just our busy lives. And so, you know, the internet allows us to kind of create this multi-reality site reality where our friends are online and offline. And this is true of religious spaces. Um, people are um, blending this, those spaces, but they're also being influenced. So, you know, I'm a Gen Xer, I'm one of those digital immigrants. And so for me, when I go to, into a religious place, space online, I'm usually coming with a set of assumptions about how you act in a church or what prayer should look like. And so I'm bringing those offline values and ideas to kind of inform how I interact with a, a, a space as well as my expectations. But we also see a generation of people that, you know, their first experience of maybe having, whether it's a, a positive debate or talking about their faith happen online first. So their online interactions are imprinting how they actually engage offline. So we're seeing this interesting, you know, the internet is both informing our spirituality as, as, as so that it's becoming more open and more dynamic, as well as there's a sense of tension between kind of what they call gener um, digital immigrants and digital natives, people who've grown up in this. And so, you know, people are often trying to create this kind of overlap to connect these spaces. Um, so if you move to the next slide. So before um, the pandemic, there was a lot of churches um, over the last 15 years in the US that have been experimenting with called multi-site church. You know, in the 80s and 90s, it was mega churches, these very large churches. Um, and people began to realize that there's a lot of weaknesses in mega churches because there's a, a lack of community oftentimes and interaction. Um, so multi-site churches are the idea you have one parent church or congregation, and then you plant other churches in the same geography or even in, in people's homes. Um, some of these churches would be like physical that you would go to. Some of them would be uh, facilitated through, um, you know, uh, the, the internet or, you know, platforms uh, like um, Second Life, uh, virtual webs and et cetera. 
And so this, there was this kind of idea in, in um, uh, emerging that church needs to, uh, to kind of play with the digital space and figure out how can we do church and connect people, especially since we live in a highly mobile, interconnected world where sometimes physical presence, it's not that we don't want to be there, but we can't. And then COVID happened. <laughs> and then, we, then nobody could meet together, um, just like we're having to deal with today. And so here, this idea of a multi-site reality of church being both online and offline has now become a reality for a lot of people. It's not just an experiment for big churches with non-denominational and evangelical kind of flares. We're all having to learn how do we basically make church both online and offline. Um, and you know, the pandemic's not over. And we, you know, we realize that you know, even for um, the, the short term this next year, a lot of people won't be able to come back into the physical space because of health limitations. And so how do we make church online and offline? What aspects of offline church should we kind of say, these are static and we should do things this way? And what ways do we need to adapt to the digital environment? For example, you know, is it the best, um, uh, you know, our mentality of kind of doing church online is often put a camera in front of the church and let's um, everyone watch uh, together. But that's not the best in a digital environment. How do we get past that kind of television model to maybe create um, and, uh, new forms of interaction? I've seen some wonderful examples of, 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 of Episcopal churches deciding we're not even gonna meet in the, the uh, for services in the church and the rectors will kind of create a home altar or even do um, mass celebration with them and maybe one other um, uh, person from the vestry or congregation in their living room. And so doing it in formal ways, reimagining it. So, and the last trait, um, if we wanna move on to the next slide, is that of storied identity. So uh, the, the Christian tradition and faith have always been about a story. It's about kind of understanding the story of Christ, understanding our relationship with him, and understanding how we blend his story and make it our story. And the internet is a great place because it almost allows us to do this kind of experimentation and blending in new ways. You know, every time we go to a social media platform, we have a choice to make about how we are gonna perform or present ourselves. So we get to recreate our identity, we to decide how we're gonna talk about ourselves, what um, uh, bits of our faith we're will include or not include. You know, especially things like Facebook or Twitter that allow you to put a religious, you know, um, uh, persuasion as part of your kind of profile. And so we are, um, the internet allows us to kind of make these tangible choices that we've been making for years, but just kind of more in more private ways. And they may, it makes it much more public. Um, and so it's about people negotiating, how do I present myself in digital spaces? How do I present myself as a person of faith? And how, what, what possibilities might that allow me that I don't have available to in the offline world? So if you can move to the next slide. The la this uh, one of the tangible ways that this raises is anyone who starts to blog has to make um, you know you create a blog you have to create some kind of a description of your blog and then you have to do a little identity um, kind of profile to kind of tell people who you are and so in those choices you're making choices about you know what how you want to be seen you know do you want to be seen as tall skinny kiwi who kind of frames himself he's a uh, comes from a non-denominational tradition. He's kind of been a missionary all over the world. So he's shows himself to be like this global Christian. Um, the internet monk is not actually a monk. Um, <laughs> he's just someone who has a deep um, interest in, um, in um, Christian spirituality, but he's kind of framed and taken on this identity the way he blogs and interacts. You know, there's whole, you know, whole genres of Christian blogging, like Christian mommy blogs, and people again are making these decisions about how they're gonna represent their faith. So this gives new again, new opportunities, but it's also the idea of, of it's individual choice making those decisions about how to define yourself as a Christian and what that could or should look like. So if we can move on to the next slide. So this is where I wanna pause because I've given you, you know, spent about 20 minutes trying to give you a lot of context for a topic that might be very new to people. But I want you to think about these, these traits of convergent practice multi-site reality and storied identity. And in what ways have, have you seen any of these traits manifest here? So I'd love to hear you know, via text, you know, some examples or maybe some things that this presentation has got you thinking about your experience of blending the online and offline this past year. And may, maybe a good way to start is um, I'll, I'll ask Becky that question to respond. 
So, you know, in what ways have, you know, either convergent practice, multi-site reality or storied identity shown up in your kind of negotiation between the online and offline and doing church? Well, I think, you know, the teaching aspect and the kind of running of small groups has totally changed. Um, we are now all gathering from in a distributed and kind of a church distributed kind of way. I'm glad you included uh uh, Northland, as that's in the community kind of close to where I uh, am from. So I'm familiar with Northland, a church distributed. Uh, so whenever I say a church distributed, I think of them. But um, now, I mean, I'm used to doing prior to all this, all of my teaching, uh, whether in the church or in academia, in person. I was at a liberal arts university. We didn't really have much in the way of online teaching at that time. And I ran away from those opportunities that I did have to do it. Um, so what's interesting is instead of everybody coming here to one central location to do church, we are seeing everyone mostly in their homes. Uh, I think sometimes people, if it's like a lunchtime thing, maybe they might be in their office if they're working from a, a work location. Um, and so I think that that, uh, I don't know if that qualifies under multi-site, but you know, this idea of, um, we're not everybody, the, the hub isn't the church. I mean, I'm, I mean, organizing it and people are coming through hearing about it through the church, but everyone is kind of wherever they are. And I feel like it's a different experience of people to everybody's kind of in the comfort of their living room or their kitchen or whatever. And so that's, that's been a difference um, that I've noticed um, in, in that. Yeah, and I know that, you know, we've um, there's often been talk about the church without walls, the idea of let's open up the church. And in this way, it's, you know, it's kind of forced opening up because we can't, you know, Zoom allows us to kind of meet, uh, meet in a new space, but also because this is on YouTube, um, a new people can come to the class that would never physically be here and may, you know, by happenstance or even by searching for it. So we oh. let's open up the walls. No, and we, you know, we're promoting our inquirers class, uh, you know, kind of boosting it on Facebook and things and making it more open to people who weren't already attending. And, and we did have someone, at least one person actually not only attended the inquirers class, but uh, was baptized and confirmed that had never set foot in St. Stephen's prior to his baptism. Uh, so, you know, that that's a kind of a cool story that we like to share in terms of we're opening our doors and connecting with people in, um, in ways, you know, that is invites people in, you know, it's, I feel like it's easy, you know, it can be intimidating to try a new church to go in person. I feel like it makes it feel a little safer if you can try a new church, but from the comfort, you know, more comfortable setting for you, you know, um, it looks like we have some uh, questions in the Q and A and in the chat. Um, so Michael is asking or commenting, I suppose convergent practice may include our surprising to us pleasure in the web or the live stream um, Sunday morning service. We live stream morning prayer uh, here. We, we, um, we don't live stream the Eucharist, but morning prayer is what we've kind of turned to for our live stream. Um, he says, they are not the same plainly as attending, but they are surprisingly valuable and to be looked forward to on Sunday. <laughs> Yeah. No, people really, um, we have a lot of positive response, like in the way we try to make it more interactive um, with our live stream on Sunday mornings, Heidi, is that people can um, greet one another in the comments, as we say, and we do that in our daily offices, our morning prayer and noonday prayer as well. Um, and then also offer prayer requests to be included live in the prayers of the people or during morning prayer, during the intercession time or noonday. Um, and it, it kind of forms a sense of community through the comments, like people can't see each other's faces or hear each other, but knowing like who else is also worshiping with you at that time, if you're watching or participating live in the prayer service seems to be really important for people in our congregation for staying in community with each other is what we've noticed. I saw someone kind of um, said the question like, how is this 
um, not like or like, um, you know, television, radio and whatnot. I just wanted to yes. know, comment on that. So obviously, you know, when um, your know, church or church services were broadcast on television or radio, um, what you get is, is kind of a, a very static perspective. You know, most uh, churches, it's like, you know, even if you have multiple cameras, it's focused on, you know, the pa pastor or priest speaking. It's, a, you know, kind of wide shot. And, you know, the people who produce the service, they had to have a lot of technical skills. Cameras are expensive. And so much more of a top down, you know, you're only getting a very select per, uh, uh, view. Um, and this is a strategy that um, a lot of priests and a lot of churches use, especially in the first couple months of the pandemic, like, uh, okay, we need to connect our people with the service. Let's put the iPhone <laughs> in the middle of the sanctuary and like get the picture. Um, and I call that the transfer strategy. We're just trying to transfer what we're doing offline, online. But people began to see that, you know, A, that's not a great shot, you know, priest is really small, um, as well as, you know, like, um, uh, so it's aesthetically, it wasn't really that, that kind of thing. And also it's like, well, this is just like television um, and it's more than that. And so, you know, um, over the months of the pandemic, uh, people, I believe would go to what I call the translate st um, strategy of like, how do we translate this? Maybe opening up the comment feed so people can comment or at least say, amen, you know, if they can't do it orally. Um, how do we maybe got, you know, with the different cameras in different direction. Maybe it's kind of like, let's do morning prayer, do it in a more intimate way, like um, uh, Becky doing it at home. Um, so creating a different atmosphere. And it's not the same as being in the sanctuary or in the chapel, but it's the idea of like, how do we adopt and adapt to this, this different environment, realizing digital media allows us to do different things. And maybe some of the old ways of doing things don't work as well. Yeah, no, I think, um... I felt like doing morning prayer, noonday prayer from home. I mean, sometimes I'll do it now from the office too, but you know, like I feel like doing it from home or wherever we are rather than, I mean, I, I could go to the church, I could go to the nave and do it. Like I could take my laptop up there and do it. I tried that a couple of times, but it felt weird. I, I think it feels more right to me to do it from a more personal space because that's where everyone else is connecting with us from too. And so we kind of feel like, all right, she's doing morning prayer, noonday prayer from her deck or her kitchen or wherever I'm doing it. Um, and yeah, I feel like it kind of kind of emphasizes that feeling of we're all in this together of kind of doing church from different places together. Yeah, and so. that's the idea of, okay, let's identify with people where they're at. Um, and, but if you, a year, 18 months ago, if you'd said, okay, everybody, we're going to go sit outside in a circle and we're going to do morning prayer here, they're going to be like, no, that's not how we do things. But realizing both technology both challenges to do do things in a different way, as well as requires us. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about, you know, churches have tried with different degrees of success, you know, um, different churches I've been in to do like small groups out in different people's homes and different parts of town, you know, different neighborhoods um, to try to reach people where they are so people you know, don't have to drive back to the church. I know in College Station, they had a small group for a while before I got there uh, that they called the SoCo, you know, the South College Station group. And I know you're familiar with the dynamic of South College Station versus where the church is versus Brian or whatever. But this idea of realizing that people didn't want to drive back into where they had just left work from, and yet they wanted to give people an opportunity to meet, you know, outside of Sundays, you know, during the week. And so this idea of being online together in these small groups on Wednesday night or Tuesday at lunch or Sunday afternoon, but wherever people want to be, um, seems to be like a different way of meeting people where they are similar along the same lines of having small groups in people's homes, I guess. So. Mm. Well, if we could move on to, I think the next slide, cause I want to, I think we're in a good place of transition. I want to, this next section looks at this question of what has the pandemic taught us about the church and digital technology? Um, and from, you know, it's taught, you know, pastors, different things. It's taught parishioners, different things. It's taught scholars like me, different things as we watched. And, you know, I remember um, in um, March, I, I follow um, uh, people online, you know, friends that are ministers as well as people that I study. Um, and, you know, in uh, from the first weekend of March, there was about a half dozen people that were live streaming their services. Um, but, uh, that, you know, over the course of um, just, you know, two weeks, we went from, I went from a half dozen to over 30 people streaming their services online with that only increasing. So looking at this question, 
of you know, what the pandemic has taught us. Um, so we can move to the next slide with the three book covers. So last year, the pandemic, um, I was on sabbatical and I also was stuck for part of the pandemic in Germany um, when I was there when it started and it took me a while to get home. And so over the course of that time, um, I was able to put together three different edited books. Um, one of them is focused on the distant church. It brings um, pastors and priests into conversation with scholars like me talking about the practicals, like how is the church doing this transition, you know, and pastors talking about what's worked and what didn't work, as well as what researchers have kind of seen before and how that has had to change. Um, the second book, Religion and Quarantine, brings together scholars who study Judaism, Islam, Christianity, um, and Hinduism, and either to talk about their own spiritual journeys and how their own faith communities and their practice had to adapt during this time, as well as how this changed how people saw religion and studied religion. And then the last book, ebook that came out um, was Digital Ecclesiology. And this is me calling on a bunch of my theologian friends and me getting to put on my theology hat to say, okay, this has been happening, you know, at that point for nine months. What theological issues does this maybe kind of force us to consider or have deeper conversations with? So all three of these books are available free online. And I'll make sure that Becky has these links if anyone's interested in checking them out. But what I want to do now is I'm going to take us through these three books, but just to... Um, six lessons, two from each book that I think that our, um, the church needs to consider, especially church leaders and congregants um, as we move forward from this point. So if we can move to the first slide, I call this lessons from the distance church. So uh, firstly, that religious leaders have, for the first time had to learn in a new way how to be a flexible and experiment. And this is a challenge, you know, moving worship online represented a, sh a shift in how people saw and used the online offline. You know, oftentimes people felt like, well, we never would put the, the mass online. Um, you know, this is, that's problematic. And, and that's a debate that many people in both the Episcopal and Catholic Church had in the 1950s when television first came on. Do we publicize the mass? Um, but leaders learning that, you know, the only way to figure this out is to experiment and, you know, realizing like, okay, the, the week that we tried to do the camera at this angle, that didn't work. Or, okay, maybe we have to move from the sanctuary into another space to do these things. So churches learned that, you know, when you're engaging with technology, it's all about experiment. And this is all totally digital culture. We talk about beta version where you put the thing that you've just created online and you test it out. And church and religious leaders don't normally like to do this. They like to get things established, make sure it's all perfect, and do a couple dry runs and then put it out there. But digital culture is forcing this new level of flexibility experimentation. Also, they've learned that it's important for us to understand the digital and realizing this is a new, not, these not, are not just two net tech, sorry, these aren't just new technologies, but it requires a new relationship and a new understanding. Digital media work in different ways than old media, as well as that digital culture has certain kind of traits. You know, again, it encourages flexibility. It encourages interconnections. Um, it doesn't encourage people gathering in one set space. It resists that events have to be static. And so this is a new way of thinking. So churches have to think, at what point um, do we kind of stick with the old ways and what and what do we innovate? Where, what's the boundaries of what's acceptable or problematic for us? If you could turn to the next slide. Um, in lessons from religion and quarantine. Um, here, again, I was talking about people from different religious traditions. Um, and so the um, move from the offline doing church or religion offline to online has caused many people to um, ponder the future of technology engaged worship as well as embodied and event-based. You know, um, a lot of people see that, hey, incorporating digital media and webcasting services might be a good strategy, not just for the pandemic, but maybe post the pandemic. How might we draw people like this example of drawing someone into the membership of the church by just an online actual interaction offer, offering that class online? Um, to what ways might, you know, that uh, technology we need to continue to be part of our reality. And also, you know, the, you know, church for us, for many people, has always been, it's about people physically meeting together, and it's about a specific event. In what ways might being the church, have to we expand that definition to not just a 
space and not just face to face. That doesn't mean we throw out <laughs> the physical gathering um, or having events, but that means saying not just defining like to be the church is to gather at one time and one place. How do we be the church when we can't do that? And when and be at post the pandemic, how do we keep doing that? Um, quarantine and being uh, also revealed the power and possibilities that technology has that many groups were, were unaware of. I mean, I think it was God's great design to actually do this because I think a lot of churches were kind of stuck in maybe certain, not just ways of seeing technology, but just ways of doing church. And this forced an innovation in many ways. It was uncomfortable, it was messy, it was chaotic, but I think it allowed us to stretch. And you know, the church is an institution that's always had to adapt and uh, adopt new things over time as culture changed, as, as history changed. Um, and this, I think this was a good moment in that challenge that we were forced into. And so seeing the positives that have come out of it rather than the uncomfortableness of it. And then finally, um, if you go to the last slide, um, the lessons from digital ecclesiology um, are here. I think digital innovations um, should not be seen as a temporary fix. And this is what a lot of the theologians said that local groups need to test and consider what practices need to be sustained beyond the current crisis. So I think some churches, you know, maybe need to keep doing their, their services or especially things like online prayer um, and, and maybe cultivate or uh, uh, those communities or groups that have formed around maybe different kind of online practices. Um, there might be other kind of technology innovations that we say, well, this was just for a time and space, but just because you know, we, everyone talks about the new normal. I really doubt that we'll be getting back to the old ways and no old version normal anytime soon, if at all. So thinking about what ways our digital media can be part of the changes that need to come. And then finally, um, uh, the future of religion is team and community based. Um, sorry about that typo, but um, I think a lot of churches realize that, you know, pastors realize, you know, we can't be an expert in everything. And a lot of them felt really uncomfortable because I don't know technology. But they, um, in a lot of examples, people came out of the woodwork either willing to learn the technology or to be kind of part of the team to help sort these things out. I call these people digital creatives. Um, people that kind of have tech skills and especially religious digital creatives, they want to use it for their faith community and for spiritual purposes. So what way might churches continue to in, uh, draw in um, people to help with these things? You know, it's not just on the ministers and the staff to do this. How might they create new teams and new ways of doing ministry that involves especially digital creatives and people that have digital passion? So if we um, move on to the last, the last slide, this is where we're up for conversation. So. Well, I want to see which of these trends raise the most concern or question for you. So I've said these and obviously I'm a very pro technology person because I've seen the possibilities. I see that it doesn't mean we embrace technology fully. Um, I believe that there obviously we need to bring our faith and our mission as a way to culture that technology to what best serves the needs and goals of the church and what God's called us to. But even within that, what, what, what ways might, what of these lessons do you think find most challenging or most things that you'd like to talk about? So I'll um, turn this over first to Becky to say, um, were there any of the lessons that really struck you? Hmm. Um, you know, I think as far as involving other people in the process, um, we have a great team who helps us with our live stream on Sunday mornings in particular, which we do from the church, uh, from the nave. It takes, there's, you know, we're not open in person, so it's not live streaming something that people are present for. So there's really only about 10 people there in the large space that we have to do that. But we have about four to five people who are very faithful we don't have a big team yet where it would like to recruit more people um, to join that team. So it's the pressure isn't always on these same four or five people, um, but they are very faithful in helping us and learning new things. And so some of the, I think some or all of them were on our AV team under traditional Ooh. church in person, and then, you know, had to learn a lot of new things um, in order to make this happen. Um, under the, we, we have, uh, 
a communication firm that has helped us to figure out some of those things and uh, helped us to get going. So we're blessed to have that resource to be able to kind of also pay some people to help us have gain the expertise and um, uh and our rector is, is very comfortable and adept at uh, adopting new technologies um, as part of a generation that kind of uh, has been part of that, you know, for longer <laughs> uh, than say someone who'd been in ministry for decades and had not uh, been adept at technology. So we have a good confluence of people who together between um, all of that um, but we're so grateful for those people who help us to do that because we can't be up there leading the service and simultaneously going back. They're really a multi-camera operation, uh, which adds layers of complication. So <laughs> to have people who can, you know, get it on the right camera at the right time and make sure the feed is flowing is so important. And uh, we're hoping to kind of build that team out to where more people can be involved in that process as well. So that, it made me think of that. Um, and, and it is a balance between, you know, how much should clergy and staff be responsible for and how much can we invite other people in to this the work of, you know, being church online, like how can we invite people into that as we hopefully also invite people into doing church with us in person, you know, like as far as you know, we have small group leaders who have pivoted their groups to being Zoom groups, you know, they, they existed before and then they were able to kind of get up to speed with the technology to keep allowing their small group to meet as a YouTube, you know, as a Zoom group. And so I think that's a way that um, our, you know, lay people in the church have stepped up to do church with us and be church with us online too. Uh, and we're grateful for that. I see there's several things in the chat, in the Q&A. Um, so the Q&A uh, was there actually just as we were leaving before. What is the future of the three characteristics you're emphasizing for U.S. churches? So I think that's more from the first half of um, the presentation. Um, so I don't know if you want to come back to that, um, but just to, I'll kind of survey all of the comments in the chat, uh, online service, Kathy commented, online services also means we get to quote, see people who are far away physically. Like we have a couple who kind of lives a lot of the time in Louisiana um, because of a work change, um, but, you know, still have ties here and they're still able to kind of actively be part of the congregation, whether they're in Louisiana or whether they're here. Um, and, and Kathy says she loves that, you know, that they can all be together regardless of whether you're here in town right now or not. Um, someone else commented, Sally, um, I've had chronic pain and haven't been able to go to church. Um, and I hope, sincerely hope St. Stephen's continues the digital experiences after COVID. You know, for those reasons, um, you know, when we think about, you know, ministry to people who are homebound for different reasons or people who are, you know, um, there are people in assisted living or in different ways that wouldn't, it would be harder for them to get to church. Um, now it becomes much easier, assuming that they have access to the technology, which is another issue, right, as far as um, the digital divide and how it kind of comes up in different ways in all of this. So thoughts on, on those things? Yeah, so I guess for the first one, I'm talking about those traits, um, you know, of like convergent practice, multi-site reality. Um, in many ways, I'm putting those forward and saying that th this is how religion is functioning. Um, but it's not just online. These are traits that I noticed because I was studying the internet, but these traits are also happening offline and were actually happening offline before. The idea of people, you know, choosing churches, you know, making choices about what church they go to, become much more of a commercial practice and choice base was, has started since the 1950s. And so the internet's just kind of put on hyperdrive, giving people more options, but people were already making those choices. Um, the idea that um, people live in this multi-site reality you know, the, the, where we blend things from multiple spaces. You know, this is happening in our work, in our education, and so, and, and, and the church. So I guess the thing I would say is that, that we need to understand that this is how religion has changed and the internet didn't do it, but the internet put it on a hyperdrive and spotlighted it. 
And so, you know, if we live in a world where people, you know, and we didn't talk about the ideas of network community, people see their community in these networks and not in geography. Um, if authority is shifting, so people kind of see thought people that are not official theologians or leaders as having religious um, uh, uh, precedent or uh, religious authority, then that means we, how as a church do we adapt? It's not a matter of debating these issues and we may not like them, but there's also a point where the church has to deal with the reality of where we're at. So that's kind of what I would say about that. And I think, you know, it's, you know yeah, I think churches are, need to make a lot of choices, you know, because, you know, there's been, I think, less, especially at the end of 2020, we just want to get back to doing face-to-face -face services. But, you know, people have invested a lot of time and a lot of energy in getting these, like, you know, a consulting company, and many people have done that, um, you know, and sometimes now, it, now it's a seamless flow, like, you know, you just have to press a mic, a button, and this, and now it, it just happens. So why, you know, waste all that resources, especially if it's benefiting people? And I think that we can blend the online and the offline in ways that are positive and not to see it as competitors. They're not competitors. They should, they should be part of the church's ministry, just in different contexts and different modes. Right. Um, no, we, we will continue to live stream worship even when we are back in person. And we did return to in-person worship for um, a couple months in the fall. Uh, the live stream was kind of still done as a separate thing, uh, but we had a simultaneously down at the other end of the building, a live service going on, and we had some services going on at different times. So we were offering, you know, different things. But I think even when we're back for in person, like at least one or two of our services will be live streamed so that people can connect for people who it's harder for them, whether geographically or because of health reasons or whatever, to be with us. And yet it's this tension, right? Because I see it, Susan uh, commented, uh, I think it's wondrous that we can enhance our role as the church universal. However, I do not want us to lose the magnificent sense of sanctuary we get in our building and being side by side with fellow worshipers, you know, like holding that intention of we're not going to throw away all that we've learned about kind of being church online um, through, you know, being kind of forced innovation during the pandemic. Like we're not throwing it away, but like, how do we hold that intention with, there is a beauty in worshiping in person mm -hmm. side by side with other people. Like how do we, how do we do both and kind of be faithful in that? And unfortunately there's not a really easy answer for that. You know, it's about each church negotiating that because I think obviously, you know, digital immigrants, you know, church, church for me is that, you know, that the sanctuary is the physical gathering. Um, but for, you know, again, for digital natives, you know, a lot of my young, young people, actually their spiritual lives and experiences start online. So there may need to be some education of saying the value of the offline and physical gathering that, you know, the internet encourages this individualism that is freeing, but maybe problematic theologically and practically. You know, if the church is just about me, well, I think scripture says a lot about that, that that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So again, this is this kind of dual head way of kind of like, you know, we don't, we shouldn't over glorify the offline, but we should, shouldn't um, uh, disregard it either saying it's, we throw it out. It's that kind of, you know, how do we just recontextualize it um, both encourage and encourage people to keep that space while also empowering the other spaces. We are about out of time. We have one last question. And then uh, as I live out the having to uh, be doing the church online and in person, but mostly online, uh, I do have to run upstairs to officiate the uh, 1015 service scene. So, um, but Frank asks, how does this affect people who are either technologically inept or who cannot afford smartphones and other technological equipment? <laughs> I think this is where the church a has to be creative and also be sensitive to that. Um, I know uh, a couple friends that they they are pastors with the Church of England, but their congregations are mostly elderly, um, and you know they, they either couldn't afford or didn't have access to. And so uh, they found out that through the internet they could set up a telephone service where they could actually record their sermon and, and ask a couple questions. Um, mm -hmm. And so you know use it it's, I, like learning what your congregation needs are where they're at and empowering them. Um, I also heard several examples of the um, churches in Indiana that got some uh, funding from a, a, uh, a grant to kind of get their technology up and running, but they realized that they need to actually buy a 
server to actually to, to webcast it. Um, and that the place where they're located, not many people had access. So they created kind of like basically picnic tables, spent money to buy picnic tables outline and created like an all outside, outside um, online cafe for people. And so again, then this brought people into the church commu community in new ways. So I think there's a lot of ways that, you know, and we can um, uh, uh, we need to partner with that, but being aware we shouldn't just prioritize the technological without realizing the limitations that some people may have. Yeah, we had someone who donated money um, or an actual lap. It was a lap if they gave us a laptop or two, or if they gave us the money specifically to get some to share with people who like maybe are in assisted living or something and don't have their own technology to connect. So, and trying to connect that, you know, gift of technology to somebody who needs it is I think something that churches can do too. I like the picnic table idea, that's nice. So, well, uh, we are um, kind of at our end point time-wise, but I'm really, um, uh, grateful for you um, taking your time to be with us on this uh, Sunday morning all the way from Texas, uh, Heidi, and I'm thankful for all of you for joining with us, uh, whether through um, our Zoom webinar, and we've also had uh, some people uh, who've been following us live on our YouTube channel, so we're, we're glad and thankful for your comments and questions and, and um, being with us this morning. So thank you for helping us uh, reflect on these things, Heidi, and thank you for um, your work and kind of bringing these different strands um, of things that are important to you and kind of allowing God to work through you um, with those interests to kind of share that with, you know, people of faith around the world. We're grateful for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I just, one last thing is um, I will make sure that Becky has the links to those three eBooks. And I also have a book called Network Theology that goes more in depth into the theological questions that some of these things we talked about raise. All right. Well, I guess I will be happy to share that there are those. Um, just reach out to me, uh, Becky at sscchurch.org, and I can put uh, those book titles and links into your hands if you are interested. So um, I will um, say, uh, happy Sunday to all of you, and um, and if you are looking to worship this morning with us, we are 1015 live stream through Facebook and YouTube, and uh, we'd be happy for any of you all to join us for worship this morning as well. So God bless, and thank you again, Heidi, for, for being with us. You're welcome. All right. Well, I'm going to end the um, webinar now and I've ended